Hey everyone, welcome to Literary Ramblings. I'm Charlotte. I'm Corey. <laughs> and we're your hip happening millennial hosts. Oh my and gosh. Every month we discuss a book from our book club that we read the previous month. And this month was my pick. And as a semi professional tourist myself, I picked The Tourist by Olin Steinhauer. And I'll give you the quick summary. The tourist follows Milo Weaver, or at least a guy who uses that alias for most of the book, as he uncovers secrets amidst the CIA organization he works for as a tourist. Tourism is a deeply undercover department that regular agents of the CIA don't even know about, and tourists are not only licensed to kill, they're told who to kill. Currently retired, pieces of Milo's past begin to collide with his present after he's contacted by an assassin who he's been trying to bring to justice. The assassin tells him someone's been pulling strings, and as Milo follows those strings, his fragile world starts to unravel. Wow, can't you just imagine reading that on the back of this book? Yeah, actually, I probably could. But See, I, I read it. you're using that degree. <laughs> yeah, using it all the time. Creative writing is worth it, guys. It is. It is. So, yeah, our main character is Milo, and the entire book... Is the entire book in his perspective? No. I was going to say. We have Tina's perspective, which is Milo's wife. Mm-hmm. And then we have, we briefly Janet. have like two other people's perspectives, but I wouldn't say that it's really like, it's probably 75 to 80% in Milo's perspective. Yeah. It feels like you're mostly in Milo's head. Yes. And then when the plot demands it, you cut away to a, a couple of the other main players. Yeah. Yeah. But it's mostly Milo. Um, unless we need some exposition from another character that Milo can't possibly get at the time. Yeah. So the book actually opens in Milo's past. And it was actually really interesting to me that they start in, it starts in this place where Milo is in a very dark headspace. And yeah. he's suicidal. Very suicidal. Yeah. yeah. Which is not how I expected to go into this book because I was expecting more of like a James Bond or Jason Bourne type, you know, right in the action, you know. Um, yeah. And it was in the action, but it was just very introspective and very like unenamored with the life of a spy. So, yeah, I was expecting a bit more of a glorification of the business of like spying on other countries and tourism sounded really cool from like the little blurb that you get but it's actually a bit more of a look at how this prevents you from becoming a normal part of society almost yeah i was i guess i was kind of expecting the same thing just because most spy movies seem to be like that just because it's like, oh, it's so cool. I guess I also didn't get of a an assassin, even though it says on the back, oh, it says, but staying retired from the field becomes impossible when the arrest of a long sought after assassin. Mm-hmm. So I guess I thought maybe he wasn't going to be as much of a killer as he really is. <laughs> I don't know how many people he actually kills in this book, though, that like we see him kill. Uh... I feel like there's only a couple that we actually see him kill. So, because we're definitely, he's past his prime. So he's, he's, you know, over the life of a spy because he's already lived a lot of life as a spy and he's past the cool parts. He's like, in the beginning, he's hooked on drugs. uh, Mm -hmm. And even that's not enough to make him care about life. So, yeah. Yeah, I like that he's only, he's like not even 40 years old, though. I actually yeah. really like that tidbit because it shows that the life of a spy is actually really difficult and it's very, very hard on your physical body, which mm-hmm. makes a lot of sense. But it seems like there's so many, especially movies, where they're like, oh, the old spy like jumps back into the game and the old spy is retired, but he's like 60 years old. And you're like, mm-hmm. is he really going to be able to get back in the game? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's like you can see them doing more of like a desk job, but not the like physical. There's actually great scenes in this book where he tries to do some of the physical stuff he could do as a younger guy. And he like almost he almost kills himself in one scene, basically on accident. Yeah, just because he physically is incapable of doing 
it anymore. Oh, we didn't really talk about like star ratings or anything like that. Mm. And I guess this is the official sto- spoiler warning so far in, but well, we haven't um, talked. About I don't remember. Spoiler. Yeah, I don't remember how many stars you gave it. Oh, I haven't given five. That. Oh, oh, you okay. haven't chosen a star rating. Well, I have, but we haven't talked about it yet on the podcast. Well, yeah. Do so you want to tell? Now? Yeah, what's your star rating? <laughs> okay. Yeah, I'm asking you what your star rating. I got rating it. Is. I got it now. Um, <laughs> I gave it four stars. So. Oh. Okay. I, I liked it quite a bit. What did you give it? I gave it three. You only My gave it three. Standard. My standard three. I don't know. I thought it was really good. But at the same time, I think it's more that it's just not really, like, my type of book. I've never been as into, like, spy things um, as you have. Yeah. But, so I think part of it is just me. But part of it also is that the plot is a little overly complex. Yeah. So... Not in a way that you felt like you could necessarily figure it out. It was like, maybe if you knew a bunch of the politics of the time of this book, you could piece it. Yeah. Yeah. But on my own, I, yeah. A lot of the book is stuff that I just kind of skimmed over. There's a lot of difficult to print names and foreign cities and all this other stuff. And it's weird because I wasn't, like, mad about it, but... Because a lot of times, even in, like, Rune of Kings last month, we talked about being upset that we didn't understand what things were going on. But in this book, I didn't care that I didn't fully understand everything that was happening. Mm-hmm. I just I just read it, and it was still pretty engaging. It was not a difficult book for me to put down mm-hmm. at all, but when I would read it, I'd read it fast. Yeah. So I, it was definitely engaging. Yeah, I think it was, because it's a very action-centered book, and it's a lot of dialogue, I feel like it moves pretty quick when you start going through it. Yeah. And I think most of the most complicated parts, like, unless you're trying to solve it, unless you want to, like, get ahead of the author, it's not very frustrating, Mm -hmm. because you can just, you know, by the end, you'll understand the main points, and he comes through with that, so. Yeah. Like, it still had a satisfying ending, even without having tracked all the tiny details that were leading up to it yeah and things he he knew how to like put in the little breadcrumbs like he'd name drop early on so that you'd be kind of familiar with the name of the city or the name of a couple of people and then so then by the time you got to when they were important you already had kind of a primer like you kind of already knew a little bit about you knew enough about them that you recognized their name and they were like, oh, you talked about these people before. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times you do it in kind of a fun way where they'd show up in a different context the next time. Yes. So then you'd be like, oh, this is the other side of their life. And you're like, "Ah." yeah. Okay, so we talked about how it begins when Milo's passed. And then in that little snapshot, I don't consider this a spoiler, he gets shot. And then that's what leads to him retiring from tourism. But he still works for the tourism department. And his boss, when he was active and as he's in quote unquote retirement, is Tom Granger, who is old enough to actually retire. Kind of like the guys we were talking about, only he never seems like he was really a field agent. Or was he? I don't remember. Tom? Yeah. not sure i don't i don't know i don't remember whether he mentioned anything about it but milo says that he's he's the voice on the end of the phone and when when he calls an agent because he's the head of the department it's basically like the voice of god to them Mm -hmm. like he pick he tells you to do something you go do it so that's tom's role and then after he retired and met tina tina is a single mom who has a daughter named Stephanie and they actually, well, is that a spoiler? I probably shouldn't go into how they met. Should I? I mean, can we give the official spoiler warning then? I think you did earlier. So, well, I gave it and then we were like, let's talk about the star rating. So I don't know. Maybe some people left. 
but yeah. <laughs> you're still here. Here's your official spoiler warning. Yeah. I'll put so, this one actually like on the screen. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Flash it on the screen. Yeah. Uh, you come back to the scene in the beginning later and you find out that the pregnant woman in that scene is actually Tina. And mm-hmm. she was pregnant with Stephanie and Milo kind of helped save her slash helped her give birth to Stephanie. Or was there in the same hospital and like Yeah, he was in the same hospital. He wasn't like with her. Yeah. Because he was shot, so they both yes. went to the hospital. <laughs> they mm-hmm. just went to the same one. And it then he just... went and he found her later. Yeah, serendipity. Sure. So, yeah. And then, so then when he goes back to the States, he ends up getting a place with her. And at the beginning of the book, they're planning a trip to Disney World. And, you know, he's trying to put the life behind him. Yeah. But then he gets a call from tom saying that they're investigating another agent who milo had worked with in the past named angela and milo liked angela and is like i can't believe she'd do anything to betray our country you know because yeah, they, like, they think that she's selling secrets yeah they think she's selling secrets to china i believe yeah and uh yeah so then tom's like that's why i'm calling you and milo's like well i'm trying to go on vacation and Tom's like, oh, fine. So he lets him go on vacation. But of course, the vacation gets interrupted. I thought he went before. I thought he went for the weekend. And he told, yeah, because he told um, Tina that he'd be back. Didn't he? Oh, yeah, you're right. Okay, scratch that. We'll just. And then. So he goes. (laughs) (laughs) No, don't cut it out. (laughs) So he goes to see Angela. And he talks to her, and he is like, she's not really selling secrets. Mm-hmm. Um, he obviously doesn't reveal that she's under suspicion. But mm-hmm. there's another agent there, too. There's another tourist, Einer. Mm-hmm. Who's been anyway, watching Angela. Yeah. So he decides that he's not selling secrets. And then he leaves her apartment. She takes her sleeping pills. And then... He goes back to the U.S. because she's in Europe. Mm-hmm. And he gets up to go to his vacation. Right. And that's He doesn't the... get on. Hang on. Hang on. I'm looking at it because he's not. Well, he met, he met he gets with the tiger call. first. I skipped that part on accident. He yeah. actually, before any of this happened, he was investigating, even though he was retired, he's been investigating that assassin, the tiger. And yes. the assassin basically gave him a message and said, you know, something's not right. This guy who paid me, I think he had me killed because I knew about this. Because basically the tiger had AIDS. And after Milo talks to him, he bites a cyanide cap in his tooth and dies. Yes. So, and then all the rest of the stuff happened. And so then he goes and he finds out that Angela... Is this when he finds out that Angela was also researching the tiger? Yeah, because it's the only... Yeah, because they meet up in that cafe and they talk about it. Oh, okay. And then they meet up at her apartment later on. And then he leaves her. And the next morning he wakes up and he finds out that Angela is dead. Yeah. And it was actually, honestly, a little sad. I didn't, like, cry. But I was like, yeah, I was, I was a little sad. I really liked Angela. I think she was a really good character. I think most of the characters in this book are pretty believable and realistic. Yeah. I didn't really feel like any of them were like too stereotypical. Tom Granger might be a little too stereotypical and fits you, but yeah. they're more peripheral character, and Granger feels more real. Fits you doesn't. Um, yeah, but he comes he in a lot late. of screen time. Or yeah. Page. Um, so he finds out that Angela is dead, and he's very sad, and he goes back to the U.S. to go on his vacation. Yeah, even though Tom right away is like, hey, they're suspicious of, because you were in her apartment last night, and then she died. Yes. Oh, and while he was talking to her in her apartment, um, Einer, the other agent that's there that's watching Angela because she's under suspicion, he... Milo tells Einar to turn off all of the surveillance stuff that they have hidden in her apartment. Mm-hmm. And because he, does. he says, yeah, and Einar does it, which I thought was dumb. <laughs> mm-hmm. 
But I mean, even one little bug. Yeah, like he just left it all off. So everything that happened in that apartment is just Lila's word for it. Yeah. I actually didn't really like that on page 124. It's the only thing that I marked in this whole book. Oh, wow. And I think it's the only time that he does this, that the author does this. So Milo is talking to Angela, and Milo thinks to himself, Milo knew this was his chance. He could call Einar to switch everything on if it wasn't already, but he mm-hmm. didn't. And weeks later, this mistake would become a nasty little detail in the history of Milo Weaver. And I was like, oh, yeah, okay. I don't know. That thing kind of bothers me, especially in a spy book <laughs> mm-hmm. where it's, it's such an artificial way to build tension. Yeah. And in fact, it sort of broke the tension for me because I was like, oh, so Milo survives the next few weeks. Yeah. At least this book yeah. doesn't take place over like a very long period of time. No, it doesn't. There's um sections of it and the first one is the end of tourism which is really short because it just gives you that quick kind of flashback and Mm -hmm. then the second part which i think is actually labeled the first part hang on i'm getting to it the second part is problems of the international tourist trade and it's from wednesday july 4th to thursday july 19th so actually if i had gone back and looked at this again and then read that line um, and weeks later, after this mistake, weeks later, this mistake would become a nasty little detail. I, w- I would be like, okay, so he he definitely survives this entire portion. Which yeah. I know that, like, you generally make the assumption that the main character is going to survive. Mm-hmm. But they they do switch perspectives every once in a while. And it's not totally unheard of for somebody to murder their main character. Especially if they have other people to switch to. Yeah. Which, at the know. beginning of the book, they set up several people that you could have switched to. I mean, Angela's yeah. an agent, Einer's an agent, yeah. Tom's still in the game, you know? Yeah. So, I mean, it, it's fine. That's the only time in the book that he does that. Yeah. And I agree. I don't, I don't love know. it. It's It's just a little annoying. It's just it's just a little break. It's a little um, plucks you out of the story just a touch. Yeah. I didn't mark that, but I actually do remember that, reading that, and being like, oh. I didn't think of it as, like, spoiling anything, but I just more as, like, yeah, it was a weird switch in tone. Yeah. So, basically, after Angela dies, Homeland Security starts investigating Milo, because, and, and they're not supposed to know that tourism exists, although clearly at least a few of them do, and... Janet Simmons is the agent who's in charge of the investigation about Milo. Yeah. And Tom ends up being kind of cornered into retiring because of the whole incident. And so Fitzhugh, who you mentioned in passing earlier, takes over for Tom and becomes the new head of tourism. Yeah. Are we going to have to go through this like point by point? Nah. We are so far. The whole plot, the whole plot. Well, yeah. <laughs> I'd say, I'd say, you know, it's hard you not to because it is being a spy book. It's really very much intertwined. And there's just there's a lot of stuff by the end of it. I feel like I was really I really didn't necessarily hugely care. I understood for the most part how things were fitting together. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, there was also a lot of just like, oh, I guess I vaguely remember that name. All yeah. right, I guess I found out he's a bad guy. Or like, oh, I found out that this guy is actually this guy. Because tourists usually have more than one alias. Mm-hmm. So sometimes you'd have to think of the different names, but they're the same person. Yeah. And I don't I, feel like that was overused, but... No, I don't think it was either. But I will say that I do think that this is another book that struggled with stakes, where it wasn't always clear what the exact stakes were of everything. I mean, obviously, my yeah. was that Angela died, but it was like... When the secrets reveal at the very end, I, it was a big reveal, but also at the same time, I was like, well, I don't know what all this really changes, because I would just see it happening again, basically. Yeah, and I hate to say it, there's been a decent amount of space between finishing this, decent amount of time between us finishing this book and recording this podcast, mm-hmm. um, and I don't fully remember the whole <laughs> twist at the end. 
<laughs> well, that's fine. You I... don't need to go into it anyway. Good, but now I'm worried that I'm going to, like, say something and it's going to ruin the whole book. No, no, it'll be fine. And if the, if it does, then that person's, like, way up more on top of it than we are, obviously. Yeah, because I don't think I would have... I, what, I, what happened in the end, I did not see coming no. at all. Yeah, I mean, I guess I kind of did by the very end, because it's more... It's less like you understand how things work together and more like you just understand that, like, certain people were good guys and now they're bad guys. And yes. now there's some bad yeah. guys that aren't as bad as you thought they were. And like you can it's tell just, their motivations change. Yeah. Or like you find something out and you're like, oh okay. Did you okay. So Milo has a past and it's a very weird past and it's very like shrouded in like secrecy. And he tells his wife when they get married some version of his past. And then she finds out that that's not true. Mm-hmm. And I did not care at nope. all. It made sense for him to lie yeah, to her. It did. And honestly, I did not really care about Milo's past to begin with. This book never made me really care about what his life was like during well, most I of his tourism or like pre Tina, because he doesn't really? really care. He was suicidal be- before her. Well, I mean, right before her, but before that, he was obviously, he's like a legend in the tourism department, so he was obviously doing some cool yeah. stuff. Yeah. I just, I guess I don't really care. <laughs> You're more interested in his re emerging to rejoin society? Yeah, I actually kind of was. I was a little more interested in his family life. Well, because and that's Tina gonna... always had like somewhat unrealistic expectations. Mm-hmm. And the daughter, um, Stephanie, she mm-hmm. always felt a little unrealistic. I think she's the only character that I was like, eh, too sweet. That doesn't feel like something that a child would say. Because oh. how old is she supposed to be? I don't remember. Eight, maybe? Between eight and twelve. I know a yeah. child who's turning eleven soon. And I know a child that is five. And neither of them would come up with the things that she says. I know that part of it is like, obviously, yeah, but it was kind of annoying because it felt like she was only ever used for exposition or like very, very brief conversations. And maybe that's part of the problem. Yeah. Is all Steph really gets is like one liners. Yeah. And I'm like, that's just not how kids like really talk. Kids love doing one liners, Mm -hmm. but they're not. They also tell stories. They love to tell stories. Yeah. And you don't really get any of that, yeah. which makes some sense because I doubt that the author is like, like that's not his focus. Yeah. But she's also like really pointed. Like mm-hmm. she just point blank is like, oh, so you're going off with the CIA or whatever. She doesn't mm-hmm. say that specifically, but she says like that. And mm-hmm. she just, I don't know. I, I never, I guess I never really got a lead on Stephanie's character. I mean, she's really minor. She's not that important. But I guess kids, writing kids in adult books, I think is always a struggle. Yeah. (laughs) Because they either don't get enough time for you to understand who they are, Mm -hmm. or they get unrealistic. They're just really unrealistically portrayed. And it's like, I don't know. I I guess I almost wish that Stephanie just didn't exist. Because she doesn't really do anything for the story except make Milo, like, because he loves her. It just makes Milo want to get back to his family more. And I was like, you could have just made Tina pregnant. That's true. But it would have been his kid. Yeah. And then it would have been, you know, she could have been pretty early on in her pregnancy. Or that could have been a reveal at some point. And then he could have, that would have raised the stakes. That's cliche, though. It's cliche, but I feel like it works better than unrealistic child character who just spews exposition and nonsense all the time she's not not nonsense i wouldn't say she's definitely guilty of being there mostly for exposition though yeah she says really pointed things and i'm just like i don't know most kids if like their parents like her because her parents uh technically milo's not her biological father but he is her father he's Mm -hmm. acting as her father and my and Tina have a lot of tension in their relationship and children her age usually pick up on that and they don't tend to want to exacerbate that. Yeah. But Stephanie says things all the time that just like, it's like she wants to start a fight. 
It's mm-hmm. very weird. I guess that's what stuck out I to mean, me most. You could maybe argue. <laughs> you could maybe argue that her biological dad puts her up to that, because he is in the picture kind of, and he kind of wants to be back with Tina in the book. Yeah, so. but he doesn't like needle anyone when he's there. No, not I mean true. you can tell that because he's you like wouldn't angry. do that as an adult. Would you insult a giant, like, man who you know works for the CIA or something? No, you wouldn't. No, but you wouldn't set your daughter up to do it either. Well, you know the CIA guy cares about her already, so. Would you really, like, no, <laughs> you are no, too definitely... afraid to talk about this guy? But then you're like, oh, my eight-year-old child, she can do it because he likes her. It's fine. I don't, <laughs> it's like, I don't think that badly of Patrick, so. Fine. No, I don't. I don't think he's that bad of a guy. He's not set up to be that bad of a guy. I was just doing hypotheticals here. Yeah. I just don't know. I just I just think Stephanie's a poorly written child character. But I think that I run into that. You run into that a lot in adult. And if it's not, if the child character isn't the focus, mm-hmm. then they're usually just very poorly put together. Yeah. But I think she is the, the worst character in the book all the other characters are pretty good i do really like milo's character and i think that he has a really good balance of flaws to Mm -hmm. like what's the word i'm thinking of good things i don't know (laughs) character traits i don't know what oh good and bad character traits like because he definitely has his problems and some of his problems are his own fault and he kind of sees that, and he's a little introspective there, but not too much. Yeah. But then he's he does try to do the right thing, and he does try to, like, figure things out. He is noble. Yeah. He's not, and he admits that he's not the smartest spy or, you know, and, like, there's times when he says Angela would have done this better, and from what we saw, it seems like he's probably right, but... Yeah. Yeah, so he's a he's a humble hero, which is kind of nice. Versus the James Bond type, you know. Invincible. Yeah. Yeah. I really liked him. So one of my questions relating to character, I came up with questions for this episode, by the way, so you'll get nice. to learn some fun opinions from us, uh, was which character do you think you're most like in the book? Charlie, I didn't think about that. See, I was going to say, I didn't give Corey any notice that I was no. about what questions I was going to use. I, I don't ever out. think about that kind of thing, though. You Oh, so you never think that when you're reading a book. You're not like, oh, that would be me. No, not really. I mean, sometimes I think about, like, oh, well, that's not what I would do. But I don't ever I don't feel like I really related too hardcore to any of them. I guess if I had to pick one, I'd probably pick Tina. Hmm. She and I kind of align on, like, she really just wants to be a good wife and mother and go on vacations with her family and live a normal life. Mm -hmm. I guess I can relate to that. Because I am not. I was going to say, at first, I was like, maybe I would be like Angela, but no. I really wouldn't, because I don't push people at all. Mm -hmm. I guess I can't really say that I would be very much like any of the spies Mm -hmm. themselves. And Tina's, like, one of the only characters that's not a spy in this book. That's true. That's true. I was seeing myself a little bit as Angela. Do I Mm -hmm. think I would be good at, like, interviewing people and, like, that part of spying? No. But I think Angela did more of, like, the background kind of stuff, you know? She did a lot of deep research. Yes. Yeah, a lot of deep research. She was very into her job. Mm -hmm. Um, and used it kind of as a distraction from her personal life, which I may be a bit guilty of sometimes. Um, Yeah. And as soon as she found something cool, something terrible happened to her. That's true. Not that anything terrible has happened to me, but I feel like I don't have the greatest luck as far as timing. Like, when I have a good idea or something, it tends to be Mm. in a very hard place to capture it. And then later, as a writer anyway, like... And yeah. I come back to it, and I can't recapture that magic, and I just feel like it's like a terrible curse or something. Yeah. So I, I mean, get hopefully that. my work never kills me, but. <laughs> yeah, I have a feeling it probably won't. 
yeah, you know, r- writing about spies is a lot safer than being a spy doing writing. So. Yeah, or like writing about actual real life spies and name dropping them throughout the whole book. Or writing about the mob. Yeah. Any of those things that's like you don't really want to toy with this too hard. Yeah. Do you, think, do you think the government agencies read books like this ever or do you just think they just laugh? I think they probably just laugh at it. Hmm. I mean, maybe some individuals in the agencies would like read books like this, but I don't think that the government would assign anybody to read these kinds of things. Yes. Yeah. I think that they probably read some of the books that come out about like the presidents and stuff like that, but hmm. I've feeling that they read them just on the basis of making sure that no national secrets are inadvertently revealed within the pages. But I mean, those would be nonfiction books, obviously. And I would say that this book didn't lean very heavily and there were basically no gadgets or any kind of like crazy Mm -hmm. stuff where you were like, oh, I wouldn't believe that this could actually happen. Yeah, I think the only like weird gadget that they had was that Einer has a thing that, um, makes it so he can unlock most cars Mm. any modern car that has um one of the electronic locks with a code he's got a little thing that like runs through codes super fast and then just unlocks the doors for him he still has to hover it though yeah i find it relatively believable it's fine i feel like that's not out of the realm of possibility it could exist already uh when did this book come out 2009 yeah so, you know, that could probably exist by now. I don't know if it existed then. It feels like something that might have existed in prototype then. Yeah, it's definitely like, an I idea that people have had for a long time. Yeah, I don't keep up on spy gadget prototypes, though. So. Well, no. <laughs> Maybe somebody listening to this is like, guys, we've had that since, like, 2006. <laughs> Please Be more up to date. <laughs> Stop spreading misinformation. That's what we're, do- well, that's what we're here for. <laughs> Wild population. That's us. Yeah, it is. It is. This is um, the books. That is related to my other question, which was, would you want to be a spy? Oh, absolutely not. I'd be terrible. I'd be like the worst spy ever. Yeah, I don't. I don't. I did some acting in college, but I can't say I was very good. So. No. Yeah. Not that you were a terrible actress, but. I I don't know, Charlotte. I don't know no. if you can like pull it off. I don't think so either. And I and physically to be like as fit as you would need to be to do some of the stuff. Yeah. They do. Well, sometimes sometimes I think about uh, that kind of question when I read books about like oh regular people who like there's a murder in their town, and then they're like I'm gonna figure it out. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, I would never do that. Because <laughs> they, like, go to, like, random people and they're like, hey, do you know anything about this? And they just, like, ask, like, somewhat pointed questions, but not, like, not, like, really pointed questions. They don't walk around asking people, like, oh, did you murder this person? But yeah. they ask, like, really, like, veiled questions. And I am not good at asking veiled questions. And I'm not good at reading people who are answering veiled questions either. Yeah, to, like, tell them so, they're lying. Yeah, so I don't feel like I would be very good at it. Because it's also, like, not really like it is in the books. Yes. Like, it's never quite as easy. Even in this book, I feel like some things were probably a little easier than they might have been. And there's, like, a lot of sharing of information between spies. mm -hmm. And I get that. Like, I didn't find that unbelievable. Yeah. But sometimes it was, like... I feel like you're getting information a little too easily. Mm. Well, but I don't know. See, but my question was, would you want to be a spy? No, I wouldn't even be good at it. Ever? I don't think I'd want to either. I don't really fancy I've... getting shot at. Ah, yeah, that that is that is a pretty hard line, isn't it? Because <laughs> I mean, I I've don't actually fancy gone as far... being tried as a traitor <laughs> to my country if something goes wrong. And yeah. honestly, I have a sneaking suspicion that the stereotype of, like, the spy that knew too much is, like, probably true to some extent. Yeah. Because, I mean, you can't just, like, you can't just, like, let somebody off the hook entirely. Like, you can't just 
really allow them to fully retire. You have to keep tabs on them forever. Yeah, yeah, because they're always going to know that now. Yeah. Yeah, see, I've gone as far as I actually, I believe I follow, like, the FBI or something on LinkedIn. Oh, yeah? I'm not I'm not saying I would ever want to be a spy, but there is a part of me that's, like, interested in this whole world of, like, you know, secret communication and, like, keeping people safe and, you know, like, that yeah. idea. Yeah, I can see, like, the draw of it. I can see why people are generally enamored with the idea of being a spy. Mm-hmm. But I think would, in practice, yeah, it wouldn't be yeah. very I think that if being a spy was just as exciting as it was in movies and you had the, the movie magic of not dying from multiple gunshot wounds, <laughs> then yeah. I feel like it wouldn't be too bad. And it would probably be really cool. But um, in real life, you usually die from the first bullet that hits you. So, yeah, especially if you're in some abandoned warehouse in Russia yep. and the Russian government is the one who's shooting at you, you're probably going to die. Yeah, and a lot of these, like, in this book, they very much frame it as tourists are normally alone. Like, yes, you might have one other person you're working with, and that's pretty much it. So, yeah. something goes bad, you're just, got you gotta figure it out or you die. Yes. Yep. So exciting. So, I don't want to be a spy, and I don't think I would be a very good spy. Hmm either which is exactly what a spy would say see so, okay now you know my secret <laughs> now i know um the other thing that comes up a little bit in this book uh which i almost wish came up more was the black book and oh, yeah. this concept that hidden somewhere in some like secret hidey hole from way back when is this book on how to be like the perfect tourist like the yeah tourist bible basically yeah and it's, like, treated like a myth, like a legend. Apparently, mm-hmm. like, every tourist at some point in their career, like, tries to find it. And nobody's ever found it. Or at least yeah. nobody's ever claimed that they found it. Mm-hmm. And Milo pretends to quote from it to several people in the book. Yes. And he also starts writing things down in what could almost be called his own black book. Yeah, which I thought was a nice touch. Yeah, but do you I think like do you think the black book exists or you think it it's literally just a myth? Um, I think that the black book exists in the way that um Milo was basically starting it. Mm. Was that probably at some point other tourists were trying to find it and then they eventually just decided to write their own. Mm-hmm. So I think that in this world it probably would exist, but it would probably exist in a few different forms. And I don't know, because if the tourists themselves can't find them, then it makes me think that any tourist that would have written one of the black books would probably have hidden it and not left any clues to it. Mm. Yeah. And just left it. Because any tourist, like, they're they're not stupid. Mm-hmm. They're really good investigators. Yeah. And they're really willing to do whatever it takes to find things. If you have even just like five or six of them casually looking for something mm-hmm. over the course of a few years, one of them is going to find it. Yeah. So I yeah. feel like the black book doesn't exist. But, but I think some maybe. Yeah. Yeah. I did like that he started writing it down because when he was quoting to Einer, I was like, oh, he actually that some pretty good advice so yeah and he quotes it like faking it he's not like quoting the actual black book because we know i mean we're inside his head and he says because einer asks him whether he thinks the black book exists and he says yes and that he found it Mm -hmm. which is a lie which is a a total lie but he quote he quote unquote quotes from it and but really he's just trying to give einer like life advice from his own life Mm mm-hmm but he frames it like it's from the black book. Yeah. Which I thought was a nice touch because he is just trying to help Einar out. Mm -hmm. I think in general, Milo is one of those people who wants to help and that's how he gets stuck doing so much of what he does in this book. He does what? He wants to help. Yeah. That's why I said he's noble. Yeah. So, and then he gets into the whole mess where they think he might have killed Angela, and then he's in being investigated, and he has to flee mm-hmm. from home security. 
Yep. And trying to figure out what really happened to Angela. Yeah. It's a whole big mess. It's a whole big mess. But really, it's it's an interesting enough mess though. It was intriguing enough. Yeah, and I I think there could have been more action. It was a, it was a very there's a lot of conversation in it and not as much actual like action scenes. Yeah, and some of the action scenes are not really like action scenes. There's not like how many shootouts are there? Like one? Uh two? Two, I think. Well, including the first one, the flashback. Yeah. The one in I'm trying not to give spoilers, but some people okay. die. Yeah. Um. <laughs> yeah, and then I guess it's not really a shootout, but the scene in the apartment. Oh, that's. Yeah. Um. The very end is what you're talking about for one of them, isn't yes. it? Okay. Yep. And then there's I another scene with that. Diner. Yeah. So that's more of an action scene. Yeah, it's more of a fight. Yeah. Although it's also kind of not. Sometimes it, it feels, I guess it feels a little more realistic because there isn't mm-hmm. that much like shooting out. Or like there's not a lot of like two people shooting at each other, which makes sense because in real life you don't make it through that many gunfights. Yeah. And you want to so, be subtle. Yes. So it, it makes a lot of sense. There isn't, but there are some times where he, like, almost dies or, like, almost becomes grievously injured, mm-hmm. but he doesn't. But usually those are times that he's just, like, on his own. Yeah. There aren't really very many tense spy moments, I suppose. You know, in spy movies, there's a lot of, like, walking around and making sure no one's tailing you, and then, like, you see someone... Mm-hmm. And, like, there's those moments and they, like, build up. Or, like, you're sitting in a cafe and you think somebody recognizes them or something. And there aren't really very many of those moments. There's just that one where I he's think... trying to... He tries to meet up with Tom again, basically. Yeah. Um, Once he's on the run from Homeland Security and that. That was kind of an interesting... It's not as interesting to read as it is to watch, though. When he was, yes. like, sneaking into think... the building. Yeah. yeah. And I think that that's why there isn't quite as much is because mm-hmm. it just doesn't read as well as it goes like visually. Mm-hmm. Which I think is a good point. And didn't both I, of us... I bet. Go ahead. Uh, well, I I was gonna say I bet that if they ever made this into a movie or TV show or something, there would probably be more of those moments. They yeah. would probably pick a lot of one of those things. Yeah, I was going to say though that I think both of us mentioned liking the scene where Tina has to ditch her tail. Yes. Because uh, it felt so real. Because mm-hmm. Tina's not a spy. She's mm-hmm. not, like... She's smart, but she's not, like, spy smart or anything like that. And she's she's being watched by an Open agency. Security. Yeah. yeah, I guess it's Homeland Security. I didn't know if that was a spoiler or not, because we're not 100% sure right off who she's being watched by. Oh, uh, that's true. Um, but anyway, and she has to kind of, like, ditch the guy, because she's going to go... Meet, meet up with, with mine. Oh. Yeah. I just don't know if that's really a spoiler. <laughs> well, it's going like to be a little bit. We gave the spoiler warning, but we do try very hard to not spoil the entire book. Yeah. Or, like, too many major plot points. Because, I I don't know, I, I appreciate discussions about books that go somewhat deep into them, but still allow me to find things out in the book if I choose to read them. But, anyway, so Tina has to ditch her own tale to go meet up with Milo and she does it just like in a really like simple, but pretty smart way. And I really liked that mm-hmm. because she outsmarted someone from Homeland security and she's just like a regular person. She's not, she doesn't have any history of being a spy or anything. Yeah. But she did do it in a smart way, in a way that you were like, Oh, I could see why this worked. Yeah. And why it wouldn't be like, it wasn't ridiculously suspicious. Mm-hmm. It was suspicious to Homeland Security, but not so much so that they were, like, trying super, super hard to find her again. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, it was really smart. Good I really job, liked that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and I also, so I partly picked this book because we have been reading a lot of fantasy, sci-fi mm-hmm. um, type books. And I do think I enjoyed having the change of pace and, like, the switch to more dialogue and... I pointed out to you almost immediately that the descriptions are so different in this book. Yes. Like yes. very matter of fact. And it was 
it was almost a culture shock to yes. go from a high fantasy novel to this like very simplified like almost I don't know spy police type mm-hmm. um vocabulary yeah lots of brand names thrown about uh yeah not that a many. Of, there's a few yeah well yeah and you know in good spots in like a way yeah. that I actually liked it yeah it didn't feel like an ad or something it was just like oh yeah that's a thing you can do when you're in the real world yeah just use them yeah and i'd say they're a lot less i there are still pretty things happening but you know how descriptions in fantasy and sci-fi can sometimes get a little like flowery you know, too poetic and yeah flowery that's the word yeah yeah that's that's not happening in this kind of book no it's very simple very like run-of-the-mill like oh it was a tall man with a beard mm-hmm. he's about six five heavy set Stuff like that. Whereas, like, in fantasy, it'd be like, his long red beard flowed down the front of his chest, and his ample stomach poured over his <laughs> pants. <laughs> I was like, okay. <laughs> yeah, it would be exactly like that. Yep. Which so. I almost, I don't know. I, I guess I like both descriptions, but I do feel like um, the descriptions in this book don't ever slow it down, ever. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But I feel like in fantasy novels and sci-fi, sometimes the descriptions will slow it down. But in fantasy and sci-fi, you have to have those descriptions because they're describing things sometimes that do not exist. Yes. So the description is all you get. Mm -hmm. Whereas in this one, it's like all this stuff exists in real life, except maybe that car thing. Yeah. So, so, you know, you don't have he doesn't have to sit down and and, uh, describe JFK Airport. No. You know, or like he can just say the brand name of a car and you can Google it, or you basically know what you're looking at, you know? Yeah. It's just a car, so it's like you can, yeah. you have a default sports car in your brain that's go close enough. Yeah, because it doesn't really matter. And, in fact, that's one of the points he makes in this book about being a tourist, is that everywhere ends up being kind of the same to him. Yeah, I actually kind of liked that. I, liked I did, that. too. I thought it was an interesting perspective. Mm-hmm. Because um, it's when he's with Einer... Because Einer is still relative, pretty young. Yeah. So Einer, like, anytime they go somewhere, like, they go to Europe a lot. Mm-hmm. And so they're in Europe, and Einer's like, I'm going to go do things, like, like, go to all the bars and blah, 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 and just experience the life, the nightlife. And mm-hmm. Milo's kind of like, yeah, I'm over that. And yep. that's when he kind of, like, thinks about how over the years he traveled to so many places and he used to do the same thing. He would go out on the town and he would just take advantage of his um, bottomless charge card that they give him and stay in all the best hotels and all this stuff. And then eventually he found that it was kind of empty Yeah, and it was all the same. Every, everywhere was the same. It didn't really matter where you went. It was all the same stuff and in different towns, Mm -hmm. which was kind of sad because then he turned to uh, methamphetamines. Yep. Can I say that on YouTube? I think so. Get us, get us in trouble. <laughs> it's towards the end of the podcast. <laughs> but not in the first five minutes. Eh. It's cool. It's cool. Yeah. Yeah. I think because the, it's only the details that really change. I mean, as someone who has been overseas and they're great details and like, it's fun to be a tourist. Like I said, I love going places and traveling, but at the end of the day, yeah, it's just a city that people built and people are doing the same kind of things in a slightly different way as they are in your own cities, you know? Yeah. So you can't you can't run away from your problems because they just follow you. Yeah. I like that that is in here. And I like the way that the reasons that he left tourism are kind of sprinkled throughout. Because the obvious reason is that he met Tina and she had Stephanie. And it was kind of just like... I don't know, I sort of love it at first sight kind of thing. Yeah. Because they literally met, she gave birth, and then they were kind of just, like, together after that. Mm Mm-hmm. But then, like, the less obvious reasons are that he was a drug addict. The less obvious reasons are that he didn't feel like anything that he was doing was fulfilling. Mm -hmm. And he, you know, was starting to lose faith in the, in, like, Tom Granger and, like, his upper management, essentially. Yeah. You know, and he started to question things. Mm-hmm. And so he kind of just decided to pull out and stop 
being a tourist. So because, I like that it's kind of, it's not just like one reason. It wasn't just mm-hmm. Tina and Stephanie. It was, it was a lot of little things. And then Tina and Stephanie kind of pushed him over the edge. Like, yeah, I'm kind of done with this, with yeah. that part of that life. So. And, and once you start to lose your belief like that, I think as someone who's putting their life on the line, like you can't have those moments of doubt no. in a critical juncture or that, that will kill you. So. Yeah. Which I think he kind of mentions. Yeah. Because yeah. he views he he views Einer as a lot more naive, but mm-hmm. he also sees a lot of himself in Einer. So I like yeah. the juxtaposition. I mean, it's an easy juxtaposition to make to put him with a young agent as he's a technically an older one. Mm-hmm. But I think it worked pretty well. Yeah, and that kind of leads into my last question. Oh, okay. Which was, do you think Milo could be content just being a family man? Yeah, I think he could. You think he, he did could? it for like five or six years. He's well, fine. but he was still kind of like working for the tourism department. Yeah, but if he had left the tourism department entirely, he probably just could have picked up a different hobby. You think so? Yeah, he could have like picked up drag racing or something else. <laughs> yeah, driving fast cars or... I mean, I feel like there's other outlets. I feel like if given the opportunity... I feel like if he had actually pulled out of tourism completely mm-hmm. that first time, I don't think that he would have gotten accidentally pulled back into it. Yeah, because he good. genuinely cares about his family. He genuinely hates lying to them, and mm-hmm. he's he genuinely wants them to have a life that but, basically like he's not in it. But he wasn't honest with them. You know, up to do you think he would have been honest with them if he had actually quit about what he did and like who he was? I think he could have been more honest. I think it would have given him the opportunity, mm. at least, to be a lot more honest. Because at that point, it wouldn't have mattered as much. But because he was still in the company, he still had a vested interest in key, in maintaining those secrets. Because yeah. they could still be used against him. But if he had really left tourism, mm-hmm. then it wouldn't have mattered. He could have told Tina and Stephanie whatever he wanted. Yeah. Because it couldn't have been used against him later. Yeah. I mean, he does seem pretty disillusioned with the whole thing, so... Yeah, I think that he might have still gotten pulled into this particular thing because of Angela, Mm -hmm. but I think it would have been a little bit harder for him to be pulled back in. And I think he would have been a little more discerning, Mm -hmm. a little faster. What about you? I don't know. I was going back and forth on it because that's kind of the question I feel like the end of the book starts to pose, you know, whether that's the life Milo can actually have. And yeah. I, yeah. Well, it's funny because a lot of the choices are just taken out of his hands because, I mean, the tiger points it out very early on where he says, um, hang on, there's a discussion question in the back that quotes it. Mm-hmm. Oh, the tiger says, that's like when Milo says, tells the tiger he's not a tourist anymore the tiger says that's like saying i'm not a murderer anymore you can change your name change your job description you can even become a bourgeoisie family man milo but really nothing changes Mm. oh and then the discussion question is how much agency does milo really have over his fate can someone ever stop being a tourist Mm. and i think that's kind of an interesting question to pose as well yeah um i think that he might have been able to. He would have definitely still had contact with some of the people mm-hmm. because Tom Granger was not just his basically upper management, but he was also like a friend mm-hmm. and very close to Milo. So yeah. I think that he would have maintained some level of connection. But at the same time, I feel like if he had pulled out completely and found a completely different job, he would have had a much better opportunity to not be pulled in. I think he would have been happier. Yeah. Because he could have been a lot more yeah. honest with his family. He mm-hmm. might not have told them everything. He might have still held some stuff back. Mm-hmm. But I feel like he could have at least told them most of it without yeah. endangering anyone. Yeah, that's interesting. And I do, I do think that like some of the instincts and stuff would be hard to get rid of. Like I think they would l- linger for a long time. But part of that is like the advantage of having a normal life is you can let go of those instincts and not be constantly like watching your back and worried about people watching you and. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um. So this book, we found out. Did you know this before? Like when you picked it, that it's the first book. I did not. I had no idea. Okay. So we didn't know. We thought this was just a standalone, but it's actually part of a four book series. At least that's as many books as it shows in the back of my book as of March 2020. So, and it's the last book is called The Last Tourist, so I'm guessing that it's the last one. <laughs> that seems like a uh, fitting ending name. Yeah. So, there's four more books, and I don't know, I did like the book and I think that it was a very quick and engaging read, but I don't think that I'm interested enough to go on especially knowing that there's three more books yeah that's quite a few yeah and the fact that i am 100 percent certain that he will not he will not be able to resist being sucked into tourism for the next two and a half until yeah. like maybe the end one and then we could see like oh how did how did he make it but i think it was pretty good it's still a good book but i'm not planning on reading the rest of them you gonna recommend it to anyone who walks into your bookstore uh, we don't carry it at my store. <laughs> you don't? No, I looked it up. I mean, we carry it. Like, the company carries it, but... So I can order it for people, but... Um, I was gonna say, mine has a sticker it. saying it's a New York Times bestseller, so... Every book is a New York Times bestseller. Well. All you have... To, okay, here's a fun fact. All you have to do to be a New York Times bestseller is sell 2,000 copies of your book within the first week. That's not much. That's not much. I mean, it's a lot for, like, a self-published author or for somebody who's not even a little bit famous. But for even but for somebody who's, like, even a little bit up there, mm -hmm. it, it, that's not that hard. I don't know if it takes into account pre-orders. I don't know if those count as sales for the first week mm. or not. But that's pretty much it. I don't know. I'm pretty sure, well, most bestseller lists, you can just buy your way onto them anyway. But... Yeah, almost every book in, Yeah, almost every single book in um our store is a New York Times bestseller. Most of them are. Well then it just becomes well, meaningless. Yeah, well most bestseller lists are more like curated lists. Except yeah. except the only thing that I really love about Amazon is that they have a chart. If you search Amazon charts on Amazon, it tells you which books are most sold and most read for fiction and nonfiction. Huh. And they go by, and for most read, they go by their Kindle stores, so they know that people are reading them, mm. which I think is cool. I think it's really interesting data, and um, it doesn't change that much, which tells me that it's probably true. <laughs> yeah, Pretty much all it takes the Harry a long Potter time books. for, like, an upset. Yeah, and it'll tell you how long things have been on the list, too. It says, like, oh, 400th week on the list. That's pretty wow. much every Harry Potter book. Is on there. I've been meaning to reread those, but that's a whole other commitment. So, yeah, I have a friend who rereads them like every year, which seems excessive, but that's to each, their own. to each their own. But anyway, so the tourist. So yeah, I would actually probably recommend this to people. I think that it's good, um, mm -hmm. but I probably won't be actually recommending it to people because I typically just recommend things that are in store. Makes sense. Because then they can buy it right then. Yeah, this is Look more like. If someone's talking about, oh, I kind of want to try a spy book. Like, this seems like an easy beginner spy yeah. book, too. Yeah. Like, yeah. it's not so intense that you can't figure it out. or And there's not well, it's not as graphic or anything like that, either. There were some scenes, no. but... Yeah, but I never... Yeah, I never felt like... I'm not hypersensitive to, like, the graphic nature of things, but I... Mm, Sometimes I am a little bit, but I didn't see anything in here that was really like terrible, or, like very questionable. Nothing made me too squeamish. Yeah, there were a couple of cringy scenes, but they're over pretty quickly. Yeah. And they had a reason for existing, so. Yeah. You know what this book didn't have a lot of was comic relief. Oh yeah, no, not like none. Down. There's like mind. that one moment where he goes into he. He's trying to get into an apartment, so he knocks on the apartment next door, and he asks the guy if he can use his bathroom. And so he <laughs> goes in, and then he climbs out the window into the apartment next door that he's been trying to get into. And then he comes out and comes back around and knocks on the guy's door again. And he <laughs> asks for his bag, because he left it in the bathroom because he couldn't get it while he was going over. And that's the only time that I was like, oh, ha. Yeah. Hilarious. 
that was it. That was like that's the only comic relief that I can remember in this. It's not it's not overly tense. So I don't yeah. think it needed a lot of comic relief, but there really isn't any. So Yeah. There's some lighter scenes, but yeah, it's definitely not a lot of humor in the actual book. Yeah. All right. Um, any closing thoughts? I guess we already said that we well, would you recommend this to other people? I would, yeah. Okay. I wouldn't uh say it'd be my summer read or like a read I'd take to the beach, but it's you know I feel like I would it's funny because I, I think of books sometimes as like times of year that I would want to read them. And I oh, yeah. feel like this was a bit more of like a winter book for me. But You know, I was about to say that. I don't think about books like that at all. Oh. But if I had to pick a season to read it in, I'd probably pick a, the winter. Yeah. It's not it's not a beach read. So, you know, if you want to look this up later, go for it in like November and I think you'll be happy. <laughs> yeah. So I'd both recommend it. It's pretty good. It, it was a very fast read. Mm-hmm. We, we had to get through this one quickly because we kind of overshot the month with the last book. But that was The Ruin of Kings. and it was But very it all long. worked out. I mean, it did. We caught up. It did. Now we got to catch up for the next one. <laughs> it's, a, it's a cycle. <laughs> yeah, it is. So, all right. Thank you for listening, like, subscribe, comment. Wait, am I supposed to say it? Because I am I did the intro. I mean, if you want to say it, you can say it. Go ahead and say it. Like, subscribe, and comment. Thanks for listening. See you Goodbye. next month, guys. Bye. Bye.